Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everybody. It's Wednesday night, and that means it's time for Friends in Fiction, the happiest night of the week. And tonight, we're especially excited to introduce you to Sarah McLean. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And this is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores. Now, our guest tonight is Sarah McLean. And I think she is the perfect author for a chilly December night because her Regency romances are steamy and dreamy. I can't wait for you to meet her. Steamy and dreamy should be her hashtag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, steamy we can dreamy. we can suggest that when she yeah, comes. Like steamy, and we'll MKA, steamy and dreamy with Sarah McLean. Uh, <laughs> I, like I have a feeling Sarah doesn't need our help with no, yeah she seems to be doing okay <laughs> I see that fine us. but as all of you know out there we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers it's the holiday season and you're buying gifts and don't take the easy way out and click use your independent booksellers when and where you can and one way to do that is to support our own friends and fiction bookshop.org page where you can find sarah's books and books by the four of us, and by all of our past guests at a discount. Of course, at bookshop.org, a portion of each sale through the Friends and Fiction shop goes to support indie bookstores, but it also supports this show. So if you enjoy watching, this is a great way to come like wind beneath our wings <laughs> to support our guests, independent bookstores, and the Friends and Fiction group itself all in one shot. You know what's as good as wind beneath our wings? Turkey what? in our bellies. Turkey in True. our bellies. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Totally. Why am I behind the butterball? <laughs> so we wanted to give you one more reminder. We wanted to give you one more reminder about Butterball's Turkey Talk line, which is celebrating its 40th anniversary and which is open to take your calls through the end of December. We have loved partnering with Butterball and I have to admit, I'm a bit ashamed to know that even they have a TikTok page when I, as we all know, I'm not cool enough to have a TikTok. So I don't even know. I don't even know I'm how to use either. TikTok. I'm not either. Man, but Butterball is cool enough to be on TikTok. So make sure to join us on our Talkin' Turkey with Butterball after show tonight for more on our partnership with Butterball and just to hear us talk turkey in general. And don't forget that our spring box is now available for order from our friends at Oxford Exchange. Order now and receive my new book, The Wedding Veil, in March, Mary Kay's The Homewreckers in May, and a special friends and fiction notebook complete with sticky flags for, for marking all your favorite pages. Plus, if you order before December 24th, you will also receive a season's readings ornament in your first shipment. Okay, now, if everybody's ready. Yeah, there it is. Love it. We are ready. To... Oh, there you go. So cute. We're going to introduce our guest, New York Times, Washington Post, and USA Today bestseller, Sarah McLean. Sarah is the author of numerous, many, lots of popular <laughs> historical romance novels, which have been translated into more than 25 languages. She is a leading advocate for the romance genre, and we're going to talk about that, and a co-host of the weekly romance podcast. I love this title, Fated Mates. 
I love that too. In fact, mm. her work in support of romance and those who read it earned her a place on Jezebel.com's She Rose list and led Entertainment Weekly to call her the elegantly fuming, utterly intoxicating queen of historical romance. I mean, I love, oh my gosh, I love that so much. She definitely does not need our steamy and dreamy help. I think she's no. still fine. She's utterly she's intoxicating. Also- that's much, that's a much better hashtag. Yeah, it, it is. That's true. She is also a columnist for the New York Times, the Washington Post and Bustle. She's a graduate of Smith College and Harvard University, and she now lives in New York City. OK, y'all. Sean, bring in Sarah. Hey, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, I got so excited about that butterball turkey line. <laughs> I, only so know it cool. from, I only know about it from like numerous watchings of the West Wing. I don't know if any of you were West Wing fans, but my very favorite West Wing Thanksgiving episode involves the president calling the butterball line and being That's recognized. Amazing. And it is great. So um, I did not know that. I, I didn't know that either. I look at Google. Really a, it's Martin Sheen. You should Google it because. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube and it's Martin Sheen pretending to be not the president of the United States oh to know, to learn more about stuffing. And it's terrific. Oh, that I'm going to have to watch amazing that. Amazing and hilarious. <laughs> We have to put that on the page or at oh least on the show. Like yeah. I almost want to stop the show right now so we can all have five minutes to go Google that clip. <laughs> I know. That it's I'm really terrific. <laughs> Please don't, Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> well, Sarah, I think we probably first met uh, at one of those random boozy um, RWA Harper Avon events over the years. But I still remember the hilarious lunch we shared with our mutual crazy friend, Susan Elizabeth Phillips in Chicago several years ago. <laughs> and just so you know, a delight. I have been, a delight. <laughs> yes, just so you know, I've been plotting to get you on Friends in Fiction for yep. almost two years now. So oh, give us a taste of Bombshell, if you would. Bombshell. Bombshell is my most recent book. It's the first in a series called Hell's Bells, which is about a Victorian era girl gang. Um, And the conceit of it was that I was writing it during 2020. um, And I was, you know, locked in my house in New York City, feeling really sad about not being able to see all my friends and hang out with them and Um, have boozy brunches with Susan Elizabeth Phillips and you, (laughs) okay? And so I wrote my, like, dreams for the year into this book. I just sort of wrote on on a post-it note on my wall. You can see this. You're in my office right now. Um, I have a post-it note on my wall that I, you know, it just said, make it fun. And that was the goal. Um, And also make it sexy. And uh, so it tells the story of Cecily Talbot, who is a bombshell, Um, the bombshell of the crew, the Hell's Bells are the girl gang, um, and they are the bombshell, the thief, the explosives expert, because every girl gang needs an explosives expert, and the kind of mastermind who brings it all together. And they spend their time hanging out and uh, smashing patriarchy and also falling in love. So Cecily Talbot, my bombshell, is the first here, and she falls for an American tavern owner with a big secret. And um, yeah, that's Bombshell. Awesome. So exciting. Don't you think Kristen would be our explosives expert in our game? (laughs) She is. You should all decide who you are. (laughs) I don't, you know, I can cook, so maybe that means I could do poison. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) This is really useful. I know. I know. I have you have to know in an emergency. Yeah, how to poison someone. So what other skills are in the gang that we can be assigned, oh, there's Sarah? A, yeah. well, Cecily has a knife, right? Cecily uh, is has a knife uh, that strapped to her thigh, but she's also- Right, but we're not going to talk about fun, that yet. Oh, okay. She's a we're gonna talk about that later. Yeah. And then Adelaide, who is the next book that comes out in the summer, it's called Heartbreaker. Um, and she is a master thief. Um, I want to be her. useful. Useful okay. in a pinch. Okay, and Imogen is the explosive the explosives expert, yes. and the mastermind is uh, called the Duchess. And you don't know very much about her, but I know a lot about her. So, I want to be the knife one. Like I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> that means Happy Mary Kay gets to be the Duchess. I like All it. Right. 
You and you're the master this? mind of all you're things. You're very Sarah. regal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the oldest anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah. Bombshell is the first, like you said, in a new series called Hell's Bells. And mm -hmm. I kind of, in a minute, want to hear about how you came up with that name. But the premise is so, I'm just going to say it. If I get beeped, I get beeped. It's so badass. <laughs> and it, it's early in the Victorian era, and a group of four aristocratic women who you just sort of went through form a gang mm -hmm. whose secret mission is to right wrongs against women. I love this. Mm -hmm. Sort of a superheroes mashup like the Avengers, but with women. I want to know, I always want to know, where where do you think the spark was for this? Besides COVID and fun and blow things up, like yeah. what was the, <laughs> I'm going to make. My, yeah, besides my like absolute adoration of beautiful people blowing things up as like a <laughs> theme in my, in media consumption for me. Um, the, I have written many romance novels. Um, I started out writing Regencies that for those of you who are historical readers, you know, would probably be more um, on the ballroom side of things. Lots of titles, lots of balls, lots of beautiful dresses. Um, and I sort of slowly over the course of the last few years have moved, had moved into, you know, I, I wrote a series about criminals in London, um, who spent a lot of time like running over rooftops and smuggling things. Love um, it. And as I was doing that, um, and watching a lot of Peaky Blinders, and watching a lot of heist movies, I started thinking about, you know, what would it look like if um, I flipped the script and I made them all women? And then I discovered that uh, they were in real there was there was a real life model for this um and that is the coolest thing i mean some of you have written historicals um you know that uh it's pretty hard to come up with an idea historically that you can't prove like that you can't find in history which is something that i think a lot of readers are surprised by like they're basically if you come up with anything um as an idea there's something in history that can prove prove it out or bear it out. Um, and I discovered the 40 elephants, which is the large, continues to be the largest shoplifting ring ever in the United Kingdom. It ran from the 1860s to the 1960s and it was run and peopled entirely by women. And <laughs> they, and they were massive and they shoplifted from every major department store. They created specialty skirts um, that they would wear, <laughs> specialty clothing that they would wear. So they could walk in like the main door of a department store and like fill their skirts with stolen goods and then walk out the side door and offload all their stolen goods to a wide web of, of other members <laughs> of the gang. They were run by queens um, and the final queen of the 40 elephants died in the 1960s and was buried in a five thousand dollar dress stolen from harrods oh so my. i'm like wild so i started reading about these this gang and i was like well it exists like everything that i would want to do with my gang with my group of women um who are not shoplifters i don't i'm not here endorsing shoplifting as a lifestyle <laughs> 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 but I am here endorsing smashing the patriarchy as a lifestyle. And so I when you, it. you know, when I sort of had this concept, I realized that whatever I had these women do, there was there were women in history who, who were real and whose shoulders they awesome. could stand on. Where'd the name came come from? Hell's Bells. Um you know, I don't know. I can remember where I was when I thought of it. I was with a group of friends, including Sophie Jordan, who I think probably some of you know. Yeah. Um, we were at a writing retreat in Kiowa Island, and I, I was talking through this idea that I wanted to write a girl gang, and it just, like, popped into my head, and that was it. Hell's Bells is just such a fun, obvious name but they they actually are not called the hell's bells in book one book one is the origin story of the name being given to them so awesome you'll learn about how that happens when you read it you know first of all i'm thinking i need to get my hands on one of these hands on one of these skirts not for shoplifting purposes i promise <laughs> but because how convenient would that be? I'm always carrying around like the world's biggest purse yeah. stuffed with like everything from candy canes to markers to like 
stickers I and mean, whatever you need with a five-year-old, right? What yeah. if I could just put it in a million pockets and offload them when necessary? I, Amazing. Like, you, Sarah, you're just opening my mind to all of these new possibilities. It's a new business idea. <laughs> we could develop, we could design them. Megan's oh here, gosh. she could help and we'll design love them. It. Could be like our new yeah. friends in fiction endeavor with Sarah. I love it. Yeah, what Sounds a great good. idea. I love it. Friends Fantastic. Fantastic. Start a friends in fiction clothing. Friends in fiction exactly. pocketed skirts. We could exactly. call it the steamy, the steamy and dreamy skirt. <laughs> no. With a disclaimer, not for shoplifting. But <laughs> right. Sarah, um, switching <laughs> tracks a little, you've become a, a, away from our shoplifting endeavors that we're planning out. Um, <laughs> we'll do that. We'll do that later offline. We'll, we'll do that off <laughs> off air exactly. So there's no evidence. Exactly. Sarah, you've become known as a romance writer who champions diversity through your podcast, through your networking, through social media. That's such an important element of what you do also. And, you know, we talk a lot on this show about being good, positive members of this overall writing community. And that is certainly something you're doing. Can you talk a little bit about why that's so important to you? Sure. Um, I think that um, I think that when you talk about romance, it's sort of hard not to talk about the fact that joy romance, the cornerstone of romance novels is about is joy, right? And happiness yeah. and um, the happily ever after, which is what so many people criticize about the genre, but what so many of us love about the genre. And I think that when you look at romance and you think about happily ever after, it's hard not to think of it as being um, really transformative and powerful and in many ways subversive. Um, happiness as an end game, uh, living your truth and living your happiness and living your best possible life is the best way to stick it to powerful people and a, <laughs> a, a society that maybe um, doesn't treat you the way that uh, you should be treated or treat you with equity. And so for me, um, it's not about sort of a, it's not about supporting diversity so much as it is about supporting um, happily ever after in all of its different forms and oh acknowledging that happily ever after comes with so much power and gives so much power to people who are too often stripped of that power, especially yes. in media, especially in literature. Um, you know, women, people of color, queer people, oftentimes in other areas of literature are put on the page to experience trauma. Um, and in my opinion, uh, the best way to to write our stories, our, our, our collective stories is to put us on the page and let us live in triumph. So, I guess that's my answer. That. I love that. What a great answer. That's a really great answer. Yeah. That's a really great answer. It kind of reminds me of, I think it was Britt Bennett who said something really similar to that, or maybe it was Jasmine Guillory who said, you know, we see all these stories that, you know, do put people in these, you know, bad spots. And she's like, I just want to write like normal stories, like where, you know, we are not having like trauma. And anyway, that was a great episode. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I mean um, it's true because it feels like um in whenever you see uh, online people say, "Oh, what's the, you know, what's the what are the 10 best romance novels of all time?" and it's always like Lolita and <laughs> War and Peace and um something Anna like Karenina. Karenina. Yeah. yeah, or Anna Karenina and so Karenina. Sort of, I can't even say you have it. a moment where you're like um all of these people die. Like literally all these women die. <laughs> <laughs> what a great no. ending. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean I think that's that's the key. And Jasmine is so great about it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. No, she was a great guest too. Um, and such a great writer. All right. You've also become a sort of romance ambassador with your own girl gang. You review romance for the Washington Post, and you're fairly fearless about taking on critics who trivialize the genre. We would love to hear you talk about that. I mean, I I think I I've said a lot of it already, but I, it just feels like when we talk about romance, it's when we think about romance as a genre, it, it really is the only genre that as, as a matter of course, like centers um, women and other marginalized people at, at the, and centers their gaze and centers them happily. And so when we talk about romance as being 
derivative or reductive or, you know, too simplistic or, you know, setting unrealistic expectations for these poor, sad readers who are, you know, off in their corners or women who, you know, just have cats and no men in their lives. Um, <laughs> the truth is that um, it's just so ridiculous. It's a ridiculous concept. It's, it's, yeah. it is in itself derivative and reductive. And I think the cool thing about romance is that it really does give us an all an opportunity to wake up in the morning and live the life we dream of living in its best possible way. Um, and so I say if these give if romance novels give people high expectations or unrealistic expectations, um, we're doing something wrong as a culture and as a world because we should all want love and we should want partnership and parity and equity and hope, romance. all the things that are coded into the genre for us. Um, and then on top of it, we should we should be able to, as women, discuss, acknowledge ourselves and our bodies as like sexual experiences and have our sexual identities not be, again, slut shamed or, or criticized in some way. Um, and romance gives us a an gives readers an opportunity to do all of that exploration and have private fantasies and public conversations all together. Love it. Yeah, I think you know, um, reading your books, I, I've had a couple of of things that I was I found fairly remarkable. You know, the women in Bombshell are pretty unapologetic about their sexuality. There are no fainting virgins in this book. No. <laughs> uh, but the other thing I the other thing I th I was uh, noticing was that you move from Regency in this to early Victorian, and mm -hmm. there are several references to Queen Victoria in Bombshell, and the people are discussing the difference in having a woman on the throne, and I wonder if you did that. And for instance, one thing I noticed was there are women of color in this story, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, women in business like Maggie O'Tiernan, who is a black Irish woman who comes to London and opens a woman friendly tavern called The Place. Does writing, setting a novel in early Victoria versus Regency, does it give you more opportunities to do more with your plot and characters? That's a good question. I think um, certainly it doesn't diverse diversity of people in London in in you know all over the world was not uncommon. I think one of the things right. that historical romance has done poorly since its inception, and I we're still we're we still have a long way to go, is um, peopling the worlds um, with historical accuracy. Right. So sixty percent of London dock workers, for example, in the Victorian era were people of color because the boats were going all over the world and they went both ways, right? Like they were picking up people all over the world and bringing them back to London. Um, so I think that Victoria, what Victoria and Victoria's reign gives, gives me as a writer is more access to the rest of the world and more access to different cultures, different people, different times, different experiences. Um, but also from my personal my my core story as a writer, right, which is women blowing stuff up metaphorically and now physically too. Um, yeah. The 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 idea of Victoria on the throne did make things more powerful for me as a writer because you would think that having a queen would make it easier for women to own business, hold power, get the vote, you know, be able to. Um, do the work that they wanted to do, make their money and keep it, those kinds of things. But in fact, and we are seeing this, we see this in our own world too, often when somebody gains power, um, or in this case, Victoria became queen, suddenly things became more restrictive for women. Um, you know, Victoria was also economy. not... So, yeah. Yeah, she wasn't hugely in favor. She was notoriously against women having the vote. Um, and so I think there's this really interesting push pull of, we don't think of the Regency because of, you know, how historical romance has always been as being free for women, but in many ways it was more free. So me being able to write in the, re in the Victorian era allows me to kind of tighten all the strings 
a little bit mm. and women are able to own business or to, you know, go to a women only club or, you know, do any number of things, but the rules outside are becoming tighter. The, the circle is closing for women. Um, and that's really, it adds conflict and it makes it more fun for me. I wonder why that's true. I wonder why with a woman on the throne, it would constrict instead of expand with the well, respect I mean, that he was given, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that it's not a hugely, I mean, I don't know, it, maybe it's, again, maybe it's reductive, but I think um, men were afraid, right? Like once you can, once a woman can be queen, what else can they do? Yeah. 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 Um, what else do you want out of us? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. What else are you going to take from us? Like you've now, you've taken, I hear you. it's hard to fight. Um, it's hard to fight, you know, the laws of primogenitor, right? She was born, yeah. she inherited the throne, yeah. but um, we can certainly keep women from, you know, claiming from getting uppity and taking things. From Any themselves. more like than taking that. Space. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank speaking you. of women who take space, um, Cecily Talbot, <laughs> the protagonist of Bombshell, is a very intriguing character. Um, one of five sisters, she's called Sexily by the Mayfair set. And we just need to know more about her and especially this knife. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking notes on the knife part. <laughs> Um, Cecily actually comes from an older, Cecily is one of those situations where, and I'm sure you've all had this, um, I wrote a series of romances called Scandal and Scoundrel about five sisters. And it was three books long. And over the course of the three books, four of the sisters got married. Um, and Cecily was was invent was sort of essential at, from throughout the series of comic relief, right? Um she was she was never intended to be her own heroine because she was funny and kind of wild and um you know, in comedy writing, there's this concept of writing a dog onto the, to, onto the page, meaning like, uh, for those of you who are Friends fans, like Joey Tribbiani is a dog. Like you can always set him down in a scene and whatever he does, um, viewers will just go with it. Kramer from Seinfeld was a dog. Um, oh my gosh, Homer Simpson is a that. dog. And so Cecily was my dog in that series. Um, so I, you know, she was just, she could always do anything. She could do anything wild. She had access to everything and readers loved her and kept sending me emails about her. You know, when is Cecily going to get her man? And, um, she got it finally. <laughs> I did a whole nother series. And then I, when I came up with Hell's Bells, I thought, well, who is the right heroine, you know, to lead us into Hell's Bells. And it was just obvious that it would be Cecily because she has so much, she is established as a character who doesn't care about what society thinks of her. She's rich, she's beautiful. She has four siblings who are all married off to powerful men. Um, and so in her mind, she, you know, she doesn't have to follow any of these rules. So she made sense as, that character, but she is a bombshell from the first moment you meet her, you know, four books or six books earlier. Um, so it was clear that she would be a femme fatale and it would be, it was clear that when I conceived of the gang, that she would be willing to kind of use those, that skill to advance their cause. And she well, has I a think. nice trapped her thigh, which is hot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Yeah. Add that to every future outfit. I mean, yeah. why not? What, why not? What? I, maybe, just maybe, maybe not. Maybe right not my volunteer at the elementary school. That but, can come yeah. standard with our pocket skirts. <gasps> <gasps> yes, pocket skirt with yes. thigh knife. I love it. Yeah, I think you'd have to have a hang tag that says "knife not included" on the skirt. Yeah, <laughs> I don't like a strap for it. Right. You know, Sarah, I was thinking as you were talking earlier, I was I was thinking about how over the course of my career, I feel like I've thought about things with each novel and the things that I explore have changed me at the core in some sometimes in small ways, sometimes in big ways. But, you know, diving into these worlds, I think, makes a difference for the writer, too. As you were talking about the things 
before that means something to you about the romance genre. I was wondering, how do you think you've changed as a person or grown as a person mm -hmm. as a result of writing these worlds and exploring these topics that you explore that are really about, about empowerment to find joy and happiness in our own lives? That's such a good question because I feel like, and it feels so woo woo to say it, but you're all writers, you know how it works. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, you have, you learn from every book, obviously, but I've learned a lot from my heroines. You know, I, oh, yeah. I think at the, I think I've always written an aspirational heroine for myself. Like I wish, mm -hmm. you know, I put a, I put a little bit of myself in every heroine, but it's always, you know, in service of writing a heroine who like, I would really like to hang out with, or I would really like to in many cases, have the courage that they have or have the, you know, the opinion, the, the willingness to step up that they have um, yeah. to, you know, throw caution to the wind the way they do. Um, so I think um, for me, writing from the start has always been aspirational. It's been about, again, writing the dream, writing the hope and writing, you know, writing your, your hope for, for partnership and parity and equity and love and happiness and joy and all the things that romance always, always guarantees. Um, and for me, it's also about, um, you know, writing, especially with romance, gives you a chance to, I think, um, explore the, the deep lows too, because yeah, yeah. if you think of a romance or any book that ends with a happily ever after, as a matter of course, as a roller coaster of emotion, the covenant that we have with our readers as writers is that we will deliver you safe and happy at the end. And so like, yeah. you're willing to explore every emotion that you can get access to yeah. in a way that um, really makes it freeing and fun. Um, I think over the years I have tried really hard to learn from other writers too, who have taught me to really be fearless when I, you know, I'm sure you all feel this way when you're reading a book and you're like, the choices she has made yes. are bananas. <laughs> I would never make those choices because I would be afraid I get stuck in the next chapter or, you know, 10 chapters forward. But um, I love fearless writers and I feel like I am um, indebted to so many fearless writers who I've well, read as a reader. Name some of them, Sarah. We would love for you to name some of the women who, or not just women, but writers whose choices, you know, kind of inspired you and gave you permission to, to try stuff. Yeah. I mean, I think for me as a romance writer, the, the person who I believe like is one of the most fearless of us is Lisa Kleypas. Um, I think she, when she gets to the, when she gets deep into the emotions of a book, she will drop you, you know, several flights of stairs <laughs> and you will just be broken there for a while until she brings <laughs> you back. And it is um, really powerful. It's, it's powerful work. Um, I have a, a deep love of Kennedy Ryan who writes these like epic, almost Danielle Steele style, style like sagas um, that are again, really exploring the like dark corners of, what it is to be a person in the world who has emotions and feelings and falls in love. Um, her All the King's Men trilogy is fantastic and, and one of my favorite rereads. Um, and then you mentioned my podcast, but the podcast came to be because I am a huge Cressley Cole fan um, and Cressley writes paranormal romances um, which I was never into. And then somebody said, oh, you have to read Cressley. Like she's she's the best there is. And um, she's written an 18 book series. And we actually started the podcast as a read along for that series because I felt, again, like I said, that she made so many fearless choices. Um, and I could go on and on. I mean, Lorraine Heath does that with her historicals. I mean, there are so many brilliant writers writing today and making these kind of big, taking big swings, swinging right for the fences. Um, awesome. And as a writer, there's something to really admire about that. And I love it even if it doesn't work, right? Yeah. I just love watching a writer swing and, you know, I'll come back for the next book, even if it fails. So that's awesome. Sarah, I I love that. it's, so, it's so inspiring to hear you talk like this. Yeah. Yeah. Do, Sarah, yeah, do you think you that all as you become, for your swing? 
Do you think as you've become more fearless on the page, it's made you more fearless off the page too? Like in life, like in life choices or decisions you see yourself making or ways you you feel like you're living? That's a good question. I don't know which comes first. That's like a chicken yeah. or egg convert question. I think there's no question that over the last, you know, four or five books, I have become more fearless in both places or at least more... How about it's less about fearlessness and more about being willing to like claim space again, like say yes. not trying to make myself smaller, yes, um, yes. not yes. trying to make my books smaller and yes. um, Good for safer. You. Yeah, yeah, and because it's scary, right? It's scary yeah. to take up space because we're yeah. all taught to take up to just be small, like take as little space as you can. Yes. Um, Gosh, yes. And I think, I don't know if writing big heroines has made me feel that way or if it's just living in a world where I refuse to like play that game anymore because I'm getting older and have less yeah. um, care <laughs> for other people's opinions. Less <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or if it's the internet or, you know, the millennium, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's something. And um. And I just, if, if I could just ask for readers to get one thing out of my books, it would be that, like, take, claim yeah. your space. Don't make I yourself. I love that. Oh, I what a great that. message. Yep. Yeah. Take your space, yeah. Um, one, I think one more question for you. Actually, we're going to ask a couple more. We're going to go away for a minute and then we'll come back and ask you for a writing tip. But did this book change during the editing process from the start when you started drafting it until you handed it in and and you had the finished bombshell. <laughs> did your idea of what the book would be, did that change during the process? Um, I think yes. I think when I conceived of the idea, it was the, the idea would be that it would be um, a more always more romance than, than the rest of the stuff. And um, as I was writing it, like I said, as I was kind of writing my opening a vein and pouring my own like hopes for 2020 onto the page, <laughs> it felt like um, it became it became a romance between, you know, obviously there's Cecily and Caleb and they are the romance. And if you're a romance right. reader, you will, I hope, really love it. But it's also a romance between friends. It's about finding your gang, finding your people and um, having mm. people stand with you and get and hold your you know, hold your hopes with you and then also have your back when you are launching yourself into literal fire. And um, it was a real joy to write this book. And yeah, there were definitely like major things that shifted because, um, you know, I have an editor <laughs> who says yeah. things like, you do too much. <laughs> I can't believe she thinks something was too much. That surprises me. <laughs> she doesn't think it's too, she never, she would never say it's too much. Yeah. But there's always like a kind of like quiet question mark in the margins. And we've been together for uh, 12 years. So now I know what that means. Um, you know the, the question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, you know, this, there's a moment, I don't want to spoil too much about this book for people who haven't read it, but there was a moment where there was a dead body on the, on the page and, um, you know, it's there. Uh, and I think it's, I hope it's kind of funny the whole bit. Um, but it actually was originally the, the cold open of the book was this dead body. Um, and my, my editor was like, I think maybe starting with a dead body sends the wrong message. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of sort of shifting of things. But, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, we, we like to know we're not the only ones. It's my pandemic it. book. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the line, I wonder if um, there'll be a category called pandemic fiction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I wonder. Yeah. There are some um, real things I'm noticing, like, um, for example, in uh, romance, a lot of heroines of the pandemic uh, have chosen not to have children. And I think oh. that's really fascinating. I think it speaks to us all sitting in our house with our kids like running around. Not that I don't love my eight-year-old, but I can <laughs> definitely see why choosing not to have one would, would be a good choice for some people. Um, so I think they're really, we're, we're just, you know, romance moves so quickly. Everybody in the genre writes so fast, not me, but many of us. Um, and I think 
we're just now starting to see like what the pandemic is delivering. Wow, yeah. that's a good point. Okay, well, you know, you've touched on some of this stuff, but we love to ask our guests for a writing tip. So how about sharing a writing tip, Sarah? Um, well, in your, would you like one? I mean, I, I gave you the fearlessness one, which, you know, is really hard to do. But my, my thought on that is always um, that if you are at a point in your manuscript where there are two options, like, oh, they could do this thing or they could do that thing. Choose the thing that is most scary to you. Like, well, if they did that, I don't know how the book would go. Um, because I feel like that's how you, well, that's how I keep myself entertained. And also I hope how, uh, how readers stay entertained. Um, but also I am absolutely terrible at accountability. Like I don't write every day. I'm not, I'm very bad at sitting down at my computer and like actually doing the work. And I actually keep a grid um, where I count every 100 words. So my manuscripts wow. are about 110,000 words and I have to write 100 words 1100 times and then the manuscript is over. So I literally have a grid where I, and I, color in a box for every 100 words and uh, I love that. that feels like it would work for you that's how I get actual words on the page that's, that's a great excellent. idea so, yeah. that's great do you have a book that you want to recommend that you're currently reading what am I reading right now um that's a good question um I just finished um let me think for a second I just I'm I'm asking I'm thinking because I had a, we just did, read Nalini Singh's Caressed by Ice for the podcast, which was delicious. That's also a paranormal romance if you're interested in paranormal. Um, but the my friend Adriana Herrera um, has a new book coming. Um, you can pre-order it now, it's coming in May. Um, but she has a Victorian, uh, a Victorian historical called uh, The Caribbean's Guide to Paris. The Caribbean Lady, Ooh. A Caribbean Lady's Guide to Paris, sorry. And it's um, set in the 1890s. And it's about a rum heiress from the Dominican Republic um, and a Scottish Duke who meet at the World's Fair in Paris. Oh, wow. 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 Amazing. Yes. So sexy. And she, you know, a awesome Latinx heroine. And um, you should all pre-order it because it is delicious. That's that is amazing. awesome. Oh, okay, up. Sarah, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for a few minutes, we're going to ask one more question, but we have some other business we got to get out of the way. <laughs> I'm here. We're out of the way. It's fun stuff. <laughs> it's good stuff to remind you of. And it's just, okay, I get to go first and remind everybody out there about our podcast, our Writer's Block podcast. We will always post links under announcements. It comes out every single Friday with our rock star librarian, Ron Block. This past week, Ron celebrated the holidays with all of us. And you're gonna wanna hear some of the stories that we told. And this week, Ron will be joined by our very own Meg Walker for the Buford special. And I don't wanna tell you any more than that. That's coming up. All right. And if you are not hanging out with us yet in the Friends and Fiction Official Book Club, you are missing out the group, which is separate from us and is run, run by our friends, Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is, you guys, more than 10 thousand strong they have ten thousand wow. members how amazing is that um Crazy. they've had some great conversations in 2021 whatever year we're in i had to stop and think for a minute <laughs> yes um <laughs> and they have so much fun coming up in 2022 um which gosh can you believe 2022 is just no. a few days away i can't believe it they um, announced but, for january february march didn't they, they did, did they announce so it? check okay. out their schedule it's amazing um they're reading books by past friends and fiction guests. And it, they're just a lot of fun so over cool. there. And Ron's over there too. He's everywhere. Ron Block is on the podcast <laughs> and the book club. You can't escape Ron Block, but who would want to? <laughs> Ron is basically to? friends in fiction now. I mean, he like, is. We he's are, quietly we are, taking us over. <laughs> yeah. We're not really necessary anymore. <laughs> you know, you know, you guys, he's probably already at a sewing machine making the skirt. Like he's going to yeah. be where we get to it. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're probably right. That's hilarious. He's so good. Oh my gosh, he's the greatest. <laughs> well, make sure that you join us for our next episode of Friends in Fiction next Wednesday right here at 7 p.m. where we will welcome the amazing Sally Hepworth and Kelly Rimmer. And then on January 12th, we will host Jeffrey Deaver. So if you're ever wondering about our schedule, it is always on our Friends in Fiction website. And um, don't miss an episode. We're always up to something. Exactly. <laughs> Usually no good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, I guess we're going to ask, um, what are we going to do now? We're going to ask Sarah about... <laughs> <laughs> values around reading and writing when you were growing up were you did you come from a big reading family yes um my reading I mean my house was full of books my current house is full of but I mean yes books were always around um my older sister who's 10 years older than me was my gateway to romance she went away to college and under her bed were like 500 harlequins and i just was lost awesome. um and i actually have a funny story about this because i think this um you said values and i think this is a, this is a good example of it but um when i was far too young to be reading these books i was reading um joanna Lindsay, and i was reading gentle rogue which is you know a, about a pirate um that's all you need to know. Fabio's on the cover. There's a pirate in it. Uh, and, I left That's it awesome. in, and I left it in the bathroom. You know, it was just like on the, on the counter in the bathroom. And my dad, who was an exclusive like bathroom mystery reader, like he would read mysteries in the bathroom in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> must have finished his like latest Nelson DeMille because he didn't have like his reading in there. And he came, he picked up Joanna Lindsay's Gentle Rogue and it fell open to one of those themes. And um, he took it to my mother and was like, do you know what she is reading? And my mother said, without missing a beat, would you prefer she was not reading? And I, I feel like that, that oh. is a perfect example of you know, what the reading value was in my house. That gave me chills. As much as there we want. So many authors that come on this show say that, that like their parents are like, you can literally read whatever you want to. Yeah. Like, I feel like we have so many authors that say that. I think that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I just, I think it's, I think reading is one of, Carrie, our, my, um, Patty and I share an editor and um, one of the things that she always said about her, her kid was that um, she always felt like, um, reading content that you wouldn't necessarily, uh, your child reading content is very different than your child seeing content. Sure. And I think yes. that that's true. Yes. I think it's a lot easier to digest yes. and kind of ease into some of the mm -hmm. best and worst things about yeah. us as, as a, as a world. Um, if yeah. you're reading. That's a good so, I think it comes with nuance. It comes with nuance, yeah. which yeah. is so important. Some of the images that you see don't necessarily. That's such yeah. a good point. And I think about some of the things that I read as a kid. I don't know if y'all agree with this, but like, you know, I'll go back and read something and be like, oh my gosh, but like, I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. Yeah. 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 Like, cause you know, was I, I was doing a, a high school um, term paper on D.H. Lawrence. And um, it was very, it was very uh, scandalous. <laughs> yeah, so I was reading Women in Love and Sons and Lovers, but the library did not have Lady Chatterley's Lover because it was banned. So oh. one of my classmates stole it out of his mom's lingerie drawer <laughs> and, and gave yeah. it to me. And so I'm reading it. My mother sees it and she goes, Lady Chatterley's Lover. Wasn't that book banned? And I said, I don't know. And she looked at me. She said, should you be reading that? And I said, it's for school. So she said, okay. <laughs> and by the way, I did not find it. I, I no. D. H. Lawrence is not my cup of tea. May I just say, <laughs> not my cup of tea at all. Okay, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today. We've loved having you. We hope everybody is going to go out and get a copy of Bombshell and teach themselves high explosives. <laughs> I'm on it. Yes, I'm on it. Me, knife wearing. Yes, the case. Google searches for how to make bathtub gunpowder. I mean, hopefully. The NSA <laughs> oh God, is not spending a lot of time watching me. 
Every yeah, now and then we'll text each other and say, uh, if I get taken in today, can you please tell them I was Googling yeah. this? Yep, for we're all on a watch list, <laughs> all of us, for sure. Yeah, my, my, Google, my Google search history for this past week in revisions, I thought, oh my God, what if someone looks that up? With, you know, they're going to really think, oh, this woman needs to be put away. Anyway, and Sarah, what's the name of the next one out that they can pre-order? It's called Heartbreaker. And it's Heartbreaker. So everybody go pre-order Heartbreaker. Thanks again so much for being with us, Sarah. Happy New Year, by the way. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. Thank Happy you all Year. so much for having me. It was a we real love treat. You. You're so much fun to talk to. We love Thanks, having Sarah. you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, everybody, stick around. That's the show. But you want to stick around for the after show, Talking Turkey with Butterball. And don't forget, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, like we're right here on the Facebook page. And if you subscribe, and we hope you will, you won't miss a thing. Plus, you'll have access to special short clips. And be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we welcome Sally Hepworth and Kelly Rimmer. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Hey. Hey. Thanks for coming back and hanging out with us. On the Butterball twice on this show, Sean. <laughs> no, oh, good. Just okay. the Butterball now. <laughs> That's <laughs> accurate, considering how much food I've consumed, consumed over the holidays. <laughs> accurate. I'll take so it. So welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Talking Turkey Butterball after show. And, you know, this year, turkey, Talking Turkey doesn't just mean food. It means all the things, all the things. <laughs> now, over the holidays, did you all have any culinary triumphs or disasters? Hmm. Hmm. I made a charcuterie board shaped <gasps> like a Christmas tree. Right. That, was that was a triumph. triumph. Usually, like, triumph. my plate of food just looks like when I'm serving, it's like this plopped here and this plopped on top of it. This one, mm -hmm. like I put some work into it and I was like, this is why people style food. It was amazing. So um, I was impressed. And now I'm like, you saw the picture. It was amazing. It was and, beautiful. And, you know, it was based on a charcuterie board. Someone, I think her handle is ain't too proud to Meg, which I love. Um, but she does these amazing charcuterie boards and I'm obsessed. There's like something for every occasion. So, um, this is serving as your warning that the next time the four of us all get together, um, there will be charcuterie and it will be beautiful. Mm. I think I might try and do it for New Year's Eve. Maybe there's like yeah. a, what would it like? Maybe like, like a, a firecracker? Star or, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Like a bursting firecracker. Yeah. And then like like the, that. Yeah, I'm going to try it. And if you mess up, you can just make it a circle and just say it's the ball that's dropping. That's what it is. That's <laughs> that's New right. Year's Eve ball. Exactly. It's the New Year's Eve ball. <laughs> Y'all, when she was talking about um, getting larger, like, you know, yeah. becoming, taking up space, mm -hmm. the song from my childhood kept popping into my head. Do you remember all that song, y'all? This little light of mine. Yeah. I'm going to make a shot. I know, Lordy, this. And hide it under a bushel. No. Um, okay. Am I crazy? Do y'all No, no, no. You, you no, you're a preacher kid, though. I don't, I don't, I don't have preacher kid songs. <laughs> oh, I know that song. I have so many preacher kid I, I songs. Too. I could write a song book. Yeah, I didn't absolutely. know the other, I didn't know the other lyrics. All I just knew was the first about, I'm going to Oh, oh okay. Yeah. 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 I just yeah. kept thinking about that. Like when she's saying that, what she means is like not dimming our light. And I really yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I love that so too. True. She was really inspiring. Yeah. She was. She was. Yeah, and I, I liked think her a lot. I, I, I've thought a lot too about how sometimes I am at those crossroads with my characters. And I think well, it would be really cool if they went this way, but I don't know my way out of that. And if they go yes. this way, yes. I know how to get, I know how to get them out of that. And like how interesting it would be because especially because like, I, I'm not a plotter at all. So to take them in that other road and see what happens. Yeah. I think yeah, I like too, it. I get scared. It means more, not scared, 
like hesitant because then I have to do more research and figure out Mm -hmm. if it's possible. And it's just a little bit harder. Well, you're not doing something different though. I mean, you know, it's a little bit different if you're writing something, although I guess she's doing that, but writing something historical. No, it's not. It's just, it's just, you're making your life a little harder and you have to be willing to do that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, But the payoff matters. Speaking of making your life harder, one more reminder about how you can make your life easier. Oh, good. And just to call the Turkey Talk line, which is open for just a couple more days. Um, you know, I know we think about them at Thanksgiving time, right? When you're thinking, oh my gosh, I have to put this turkey in the oven and who knows how long it's going to take or how I know if it's going to be done. But there are a lot of turkey questions that they will answer for you. And they are always open throughout November, throughout December, which is almost drawing to a close. But after that, you can still find them on Facebook, on TikTok, Mm -hmm. on Instagram. They are everywhere for all your turkey inspiration. So it's been so fun talking about the turkey talk line over Mm -hmm. the last couple months and um, just how cool that it's their 40th anniversary. I think it's neat. And now we know that they were on West Wing. Who knew? I'm looking at it. Literally. I know. Yes. Yes. For the, I don't, did everybody hear that? Oh yeah. Sarah said that on the show. I was thinking she said it on the, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, that's so cool. I did not know that. So now we've got to go check that out for sure. Absolutely. And I think this is a great time for Turkey because, you know, we're all kind of starting to think about getting off that holiday weight and yep. something a little leaner. But man, I have yeah. tried so many different um, turkey dishes over the past few months, like just experimenting with different things. And what's so your favorite? Good. What's your favorite? You know, I, this is going to sound, I think I said this um, last time. Well, no, this is something different. So I actually did this um, yesterday and it's so, so good. Um, I made these zucchini boats. And like you take the zucchini and you cut it in half and you kind of scoop the inside out and you put ground turkey inside it. And then like you mix it with like taco mix and um, put the turkey inside it and then do cheese on top. And it's so delicious. I should find the actual recipe and like share it with people, but it's so good. And it's from like skinny taste or something. Like it's really, um, but but the turkey is so good. It's so good. And it's, um, it's just like a good combination of flavors and textures and all that. That's awesome. Tom made a, um, you know, cause I've been crazy trying to finish this book. He's been, he took over in the kitchen and, um, you know, I find recipes and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make that. Well, last week he made this, um, lasagna soup with, uh, oh. with, uh, ground Turkey sausage. And it was really good. You, you break up lasagna noodles and you use spinach, fresh spinach, baby spinach oh, wow. and vegetables and chicken broth and, um, some, oh. um, some um tomato um crushed tomatoes so it was like a decuck it was like a deconstructed lasagna soup and then then after you you serve it you put it in a bowl then you put in a um uh you plop in some ricotta cheese and some parmesan oh Oh i love that that sounds it sounds hearty but healthy it sounds really tasty really yeah it's really good i um I like using ground turkey to make um, lettuce wraps, like the kind you can get at, P- yeah. you know, similar to how you get at so uh, P.F. Chang's. And they're really like, they're just healthy and refreshing. You know, you wrap it in the lettuce, hence the name, right? Um, but it, I think ground turkey is kind of just the perfect, um, yeah. the perfect meat to use in those too. You know, speaking of lettuce wraps, I mean, this is not nearly as like involved as, but one of my new favorite things has been just to take like a slice of like deli meat turkey that you don't even have to cook that you're just buying and like take the lettuce and the turkey and stick a pickle in it and like wrap it up. And like, it's the, it's so good. Like it's like crunchy and it's got protein. So it's kind of filling and we are now the cooking show. Sorry. We're now the cooking show. Like this was not even what we were supposed to be talking about. No, now we're the cooking show. Now I'm like, will you text me that? Will you text me that? Will you text me that? Well, well, what's actually, everyone reading? <laughs> you know what? I, oh. I should I should add that as our partner, part of our partnership with Butterball, they haven't asked us to like go on and on about what we could. No, do. They have we're not. just doing that. <laughs> they didn't ask us to talk about any of this, and they're probably going to be like, "And enough, you guys." Enough of the turkey. Well, I'm in South Carolina for all of these holidays we've had, and I went today and got fresh shrimp. So I'm sitting here thinking. To how much fun it would be to cook them and cut them up and roll them in the lettuce wraps like that. That's yeah. a great idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
I'm just expanding the cooking show a little bit. Just yeah, I just like to a I different lean, like seafood yeah. category. Maybe we need a I seafood like partner for next. So what's everybody doing for New Year's Eve? Oh, gosh. I have a house full with a three-year-old and a nine-week-old and oh. family. And we'll probably be well asleep before that. But New Year's Eve is my daughter's birthday. So oh, she was yeah. born on New Year's Day, just like our Meg was born on Christmas Day. She was born on New Year's Day. So if we make it till awesome. midnight, <laughs> we sing Old Lang Syne and immediately move into Happy Birthday. I love, oh, I love that. that. I, love I love that so much. That's awesome. We've got, a, we've got a family wedding New Year's Eve. Oh, that's oh, nice. nice. That's really fun. Yeah, it's... Um, it's about a, uh, an hour north of Atlanta. Our nephew's getting married. So um, we'll have a big night out. We're staying in a hotel. Ooh, nice. Nice. I went to a beautiful wedding once in Del Delonica. Delonica. Is that, yeah, is that about, is that yeah. About, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember being close to Atlanta. Is it anywhere near there or? Yeah. It's, a, it's about, a, it's about an hour north of here. It's okay. a gold mine town. Actually. They, they, mm -hmm. they mine gold there. Nice. They have a book festival too. Yeah, oh, they nice. do. Yeah. I was at that book festival years ago with Diana Gabaldon. Wow. Oh my goodness. That's really I know. Cool. Yeah. We're doing something kind of different that I think is going to be really fun. We were supposed to go to like a big band party that we go to every year, but I'm just a little bit like, not sure that, I don't know. So a few of us got together. They're like, I think it's like five or six couples and our kids are all friends. And so um, we're going to do a dinner and it's like, we're neighbors. We live like two houses apart. So the kids can kind of run back and forth because they're all like old enough to have like, I mean, they can't be like alone, but they can have like a little, you know, right. I mean, freedom. Freedom. So yeah. we just thought it'd be fun to do like a parent's house and a kid's house and kind of go back and forth and have a like, little, awesome. so I think be it's going to be fun. I think it'll be fun. That sounds so cool. We have, um, our, our next door neighbors have a grandson who's Noah's age and he's here Aww. every week and he's Noah's best friend. That. Um, and I think we're going to spend New Year's with them. Um, the the um, dad in the family, Mark, um, used to work in the restaurant industry. And so he always has such great ideas about food to prepare. And mm. I think we're going to do seafood. We're going to do oysters and um, and crab and um, and peel and eat shrimp and all like we're a whole We're back to the cooking show. We're back I to know. The I know. But I'm so excited about it. So we're looking forward to that. They're neighbors we really love. And it'll be nice to ring in the new year with them. Be great. Well, that's awesome. Well, if anyone needs, um, you know, to ring in the new year with something exciting, a couple things that I, something that we didn't really talk about, but just to remind everyone, do make sure that you follow along with our reading challenge this year. That's going to be so fun. Yeah. We have a different category every month. We're not like sticking you with, oh, we're all reading this book. It's just like categories. And now I will say, you know, all of our new releases will conveniently fit into those <laughs> categories. <laughs> So if you're going to read our book that month anyway, you've already like checked off your category. And I don't know about everybody else. The four of us are going to be checking ours off in our friends and fiction reading journals. So we're pretty yes. pumped about that. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And we'll be telling people what we chose for the category. Oh, yeah. It's going to be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be great. Okay, guys. I, um, I think I need to go figure out what's for supper tonight. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Right. Y'all are awesome. Happy New Year. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year. Everybody in 2022. And I'm like, we're like, Happy New Year. Like, we won't talk every 11 minutes. I was going to say. Like, <laughs> we're going to miss you hang up and text. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, happy everybody. Happy New Year, Sean and Meg. Happy New Year, Meg. Happy New Year, Sean. See you in 22.